Okay. Good evening and welcome to the Culinary Historians of Chicago. Uh, this is our 30th year of existence and it's been a wonderful existence. We put on hundreds of meetings since, uh, since uh, we started 30 years ago in September or October is actually our 30th anniversary. And uh, we, we've been continuing onward. And um, we've, we have, we've had so many wonderful speakers. We've got a wonderful one tonight. And let me tell you a little bit about our speaker today, Bill St. John. Bill is from Denver, but he's practically a native Chicagoan because he's worked here for the Chicago Tribune. And um, he's, during his long career, he's, he's, had, he's, had a, he's like a Renaissance man. He's done a little bit of everything. He's worked in the kitchen on the Orient Express. He's interviewed the nuns who cook for the Pope. He's done so much more. And we, Bill and I were talking about his, his offering his shoulder as a resting place for a napping Julia Child twice during boring meetings. And I can attest to something like that because I would attend a number of conferences with Julia Child and she would go from morning until the social hours at the conferences at night. But during the conference meetings, she would fall asleep um, and, and we knew that because during the, the, while the speaker was speaking, we'd hear this loud snoring and we always knew it was coming from Julia, but she was a live wire. Anyway, Bill has a lot of stories about Julia Child. He can talk about that another time, but Bill has written about food for nearly 50 years, including a, the five, his five-year stint at the Tribune where he covered wine and food pairing. And I think, Bill, you probably worked with your namesake, uh, Bill Rice, mm. to the food and wine columnist who actually lived a block from me and was one of my big mentors. Uh, anyway, he, uh, Bill has also lectured on history, food, wine, and religion for students at the University of Chicago Graham School. And Bill is now live from Denver. And in, in his native Denver, he was a newspaper and magazine journalist, television reporter, and college professor. So uh, he's got a lot to offer, and he knows a lot about food history, and he's covering the tip of the iceberg tonight, when, what he's going to tell us about. So, Bill, take it away. Thank you, Scott. Um, it's nice to be here speaking to a bunch of people from uh, the Chicago area, because I spent uh, 14 years there from, nine, from 20, 2002 to, uh, to, until 2016, when I came back here to my hometown. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about something that fascinates me, which is called um, by many people and, and has been called by me the Columbian Exchange, which is that uh, massive movement of foodstuffs and also animals and plants and uh, diseases and peoples from uh, the two hemispheres of the Eastern Hemisphere and the Western to the Western Hemisphere or vice versa um, after uh, the 1492 voyage of Christopher Columbus. Um, I taught myself something today though. I don't know that it's proper to call it the Columbian exchange because it just started in 1492 and it, the exchange of foodstuffs and so forth went on for many, many decades uh, in, in case, in some cases, actually a couple centuries um, after Columbus's uh, initial voyages. Uh, Hernan Cortez, for instance, was very important in bringing foodstuffs from our part of the world to uh, Europe. Pizarro also did so. Um, the Portuguese themselves also were quite involved in the movement of foodstuffs and, and um, other items from uh, all over many different hemispheres since they were such uh, enormous world travelers um, in their day. But uh, I wanna play a little game if, if we can, we can use the chat or um, Kathy can direct you if you raise your hand in the uh, reactions uh, peg, or uh, if you un unmute yourself and just shout out an answer. I wanted to uh, uh, sort of play with you guys and see if you knew what a food item, what direction a food item traveled. So um, I'm going to ask whether it went from the east to the west or from the west to the east. The east being Africa, Asia, and Europe. Um, the West being North and South and Central America, and also the Caribbean. So if I ask if something, uh, if, if it went from the East to the West, it would be from those places to us, I say us in, those, in that context, or from the West to the East, from us to 
um, those other um, those other locales. So um, sugarcane. Anybody have any idea how sugarcane got here? Actually, was it from the east to the west, or from the, was was it here always? It came from the east. Um, the onion and other alliums, garlics, leeks, and so forth. East, east to the west or west to the east? East to the west, good. The avocado, west to the east, east to the west. West to the east, west to the east, good, good, you got that right. That was in the early 1500s. Columbus didn't have anything to do with getting the avocado over to Europe. The potato. Anyone? West to east, west to east, very good. You guys are already sharp. Coffee, coffee beans. East to west, west to east, east to west, east to west. Good. In fact, it came from uh, it, it only it came to our continent, the North American continent, in the in the in the seventeen hundreds. It took a long time to get here, much much after uh, Columbus um, from Europe. Um, but the Europeans themselves got it from uh, Africa and Ethiopia. The horse, east to west, west to east. Do we give the horse to the world? It came from the east to the west. Good. The honeybee. Anyone? The honeybee. East to west. Good. East to west. From the English. We got the, we got the honeybee from the English in 1622. Uh, Columbus, Pizarro, Cortez, none of them had anything to do with the honeybee. But the English gave us the, gave us the United States. Um, well, we weren't the United States at the time, but gave us um, the honeybee. The banana. Think about this, the banana. Did it go from the east to the west or the west to the east? That's a tough one. It went from the east to the west because um, it's it's uh, it, it came up. We got it in 1516 in Panama. It came to it got to Europe via Africa um, uh, in 1402, prior to Columbus, actually. Um, and it's a it's an African uh, Asian fruit, and um, um, the, the word banana comes from a Gideon word. So we didn't get the banana here until uh, Panama, what, uh, after, slightly after Columbus in 1516. And finally, cacao, the basis for chocolate, east to west or west to east, east to west. It came from Mexico, 1522, the famous stories about Moctezuma drinking uh, cacao flavored with chile and, and hot water um, when uh, Cortez was in, uh, was in his court. And the saddest things to ask about are things like bubonic plague, malaria, measles, smallpox, typhus, yellow fever. They all came here from the east. And um, it, that's a sad, very sad thing. But that's exactly what what happened. So the the Columbus really was responsible for getting things to to the west side west side of the hemispheres, uh, only in terms of things like maize, corn, tobacco, sweet potatoes, not the regular potato that came after Columbus, chiles, um, and different kinds of what uh, uh, sort of hard beans, dried beans. The what the Nuhaka people. Uh, the Aztec language called um, arico or, or arico. It's kind of like the, the word arico from, in French. Cortez in the 1500s um, brought many, many things east. Uh, long fiber cotton, avocado, pineapple, uh, cacao, not Columbus. Cacao is from Cortez. Squash, more beans, more hard beans, dried beans. Uh, the tomato, it took a long time to get its uh, uh, landing in the in Europe, and the cassava root, and it was Pizarro who brought the brought the potato. So I'd like to talk about six different, well, actually seven, but six different uh, elements going from west to east and east to west. Um, and I, I wrote about these on on um, for the Denver Post over the last couple of years, and um, I, I call it a and it was a series of articles on the Columbian Exchange. All of which, by the way, you can find on my website, uh, BillStJohn.com, B-I-L-L-S-T-J-O-H-N.com. It's on the bottom of the email that Kathy and Scott sent out, uh, <clears throat> inviting you here. Um, the first is corn or maize, as most people actually call it. 
uh, on the globe. Um, I'm just going to go over some things I think are fascinating that I learned about these items. Um, things that I think are just um, really, really notable about these items as they made their way to um, the opposite uh, hemisphere and um, have grown in, in influence over the, over the whole world, actually. Um, corn or maize is the most important grain consumed by uh, most of the human beings in uh, Latin America and also Africa. It is the second most consumed uh, grain on, on the planet. Um, but it's oddly, um, of the three global grains, uh, rice, wheat, and maize, it's the only one that is grown primarily for um, indirect human consumption. That is to say, uh, rice and wheat um, are, are directly eaten by um, humans, but um, humans eat only about a fifth of the maize grown globally. The other uh, four fifths are um, one one fifth of which is is well one fifth of corn is used to produce uh, other kinds of food and fuel, but um, uh, most animal most uh, corn is consumed by animals, um, and it is uh, actually we we consume more corn by eating chickens and beef than we do eating corn on the cob or um, three-colored salad. The point is corn is eaten very interestingly of all the, the, of the three major grains, maize, wheat, and rice, um, least directly by human beings. Um, it originated as a wild grass. Uh, some believe it was very, very difficult, even to this day, um, unclear about exactly where uh, maize came from um, in its very origins, um, but there's there's some belief that it was a very small little grass called teosante that um, might sort of um, hybridized itself into what we consider corn. Sad to say that now 90 percent, most most people in, in Mexico, the Mexicans eat about 200 pounds of corn per person per year, largely in the form of tortillas. Um, or masa, um, and um, but ninety eight percent of that is uh, American or United States corn, um, and there's been movements um, in the last fifteen ten years for Mexicans to pay more attention to indigenous corn varieties and to consume more of that than importing corn from uh, the United States. Um, it, corn is a if you've been to England or the UK, um, you um, uh, you know that they, they call corn almost any grain. Like there's the corn laws, which have to do with oats, and um, corn is a synonym for um, grain, uh, just in general, uh, in England. Um, what was oh? There are four different kinds of corn that I find interesting. There's flint corn, which is fodder corn, corn that animals eat. A dent corn, which you can see a lot sometimes. Um, the, uh, um, the, the little dent, the indentation on the individual kernels has to do with the fact that in, in those kinds of corns, there are two different starches, a hard starch and a soft starch. And the soft starch, as it dries, makes, you know, it, it's it indents. So it's like a little um, evaporation that causes that. Popcorn is a third species of corn, and was probably, I, I read a very interesting thing the other day about um, American honey, um, uh, but uh, eating, <laughs> uh, eating popcorn was something that Native uh, Indigenous Americans did, um, and they, uh, they ate it with uh, sweeteners like um, agave or um, if they had wild hun honeybees, not Make, not the honeybees that the English brought us, but the wild bees, they would take that honey and put it on there. That might be the original American indigenous dish uh, with corn. It's, it's popcorn flavored that way. And then there's the fourth kind of corn is flour corn or meal corn. So Columbus brought corn back to Europe in 1493. By the way, before I forget, 
this book I like very, very much called uh, 1493. It's by Charles C. Mann, and it's about um, that huge Columbia, Colombian exchange uh, worldwide. Now, second, chicken went from the east to the west. Um, chicken is uh, in, in is a uh, Gallus Gallus domesticus traces its origins back to India, Persia, Great uh, Greece, Rome. That that sort of spice trail almost. Um, and then there's a second kind of chicken uh, from the wild of Thailand. But um, we didn't get chicken in this continent. Um, because of, uh, of Columbus or Cortez or any of these explorers. Um, the fowl that people ate um, for centuries was uh, the fowl that you read about in Dickens and so forth. Pheasant, duck, goose, dove, even swan. Swan was very, very delectable for Romans and, and others. Um, the chicken was used almost, um, well, it was, in, uh, it was used as an augury. Uh, the rooster had its calling to warn human beings uh, in the village to wake them up. Um, the The idea of eating chickens is is, is, is relatively um, early modern, and um, um, but it did come from the east to the west. And um, we eat a lot of chicken, whether it's good chicken or tasty chicken is not the issue right now because. It uh, has been for a long time the tofu of the meat protein of uh, of the of the grocery store, uh, meant to carry flavors, not to have much of its own. Um, I think when you ask somebody what something strange tastes like, and they say it tastes like chicken, is is almost it's not an insult to the thing itself, but it's an insult to chicken. <laughs> um, so, but I find that a very interesting kind of food too, from the east to the west but did not come through Columbus or Pizarro or Cortez. Third, the potato. This is a fascinating thing for me. I just uh, am just, I just love potatoes. I ever since a trip to Peru to, and, and, and to see so many different kinds of potatoes in, uh, in the outdoor markets. Uh, we in Colorado are very fond of blue potatoes, purple potatoes, red potatoes as many people are now in this country. But uh, when you go to uh, South America and you go to an outdoor market and see the hundreds of different kinds of potatoes that are there, it's, it's, it's just it's terribly fascinating. And the, the Andeans, the ancient Andeans, uh, Incans and so forth, taught, taught us about how to freeze dry potato mash, um, the, the storage of potatoes and um, and, and of course, in the, in, in the eating of potatoes. But historically, potatoes have been uh, an absolutely um, magnificent uh, food um, for, for the world. Um, but Pizarro brought the potato, as I said, back to the Royal Court of Spain in 1588. Um, the top five food crops of the globe are these in order. Sugarcane, which uh, came uh, from um, which Columbus brought here via Africa. The, the Europeans got it because of Africa. Maize, second, is the second largest food crop grown on the globe. Rice, third, wheat, fourth, and fifth, the potato. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's been a very um, proud player in history. Scholars actually attribute uh, the rise of certain nations in Europe to the potato because it fed populations and allowed them to, uh, to grow and, and then to dominate the world uh, order in the beginning in the mid 1700s and into the 20th century. Um, William McNeil, the, the, the historian said that uh, the potato fueled the rise of the West, which I find interesting when you think of it it was very influential in the development of our own country, as you know, because of the potato famine of uh, the mid-1800s uh, in Ireland. A million Irish died, but a million Irish also emigrated to this country. And, um, and um, it, I read the other day that in, in early 1800s, an Irish male worker ate 12 pounds of potatoes a day. So. Um, it was very influential for them. But my favorite story about the potato has to do with 
um, Louis the Sixteenth. I don't know if anybody saw the PBS series of Marie Antoinette, but I'll always consider uh, Louis the Sixteenth as this sort of handsome young man, and and Marie Antoinette um, well played by <laughs> by that other act by that actress. But Louis the Sixteenth loved potatoes, mostly at the beginning because of their beautiful purple white uh, flower that he would put in his uh, lapel if he had a lapel in his dress. I think I saw one episode of that where the young actor wore a potato flower. Um, but uh, Louis the Sixteenth uh, tried to get um, the potato uh, widespread in France uh, for for its nutri nutritive value. But people were afraid of it because it's a member of the nightshade family, uh, as is the tomato and the eggplant, the aubergine, and others. There are many, many hundreds of plants and, and vegetables that are members of the, night, of the nightshade family, Solanum. And um, in order to, to get, sort of get, he, he, he did in his garden in the Tuileries, a very interesting thing. He built a large potato patch. He planted a large potato patch and, a, and then a shallow moat around it, surrounding it. And he stationed soldiers of his guard um, to stand at, uh, at per, diff, at, around the perimeter uh, at dusk, uh, instructing them uh, to, to leave two or three hours after the sun went down. And um, the people of Paris were just like, why, what is Louis protecting? What is he trying to keep us away, uh, keep us away from? And it was, it was or were these potato plants. So when the guards left, the, pe the people would, would sneak in and dig up these little plants, these tubers, and, and take them back, um, plant them in their own little gardens. And in a very interesting way, he got people, because it was made up to be a forbidden fruit, to plant and, and spread the potato in the country of France by that, uh, by that, uh, by that ruse. Potatoes from the west to the east via Cortez in the early 1500s. Um, the, the fourth... <laughs> The fourth thing that I love about the Columbian Exchange is, is how we got the hog. Um, we got it um, um, from the east to the west. The hog is, uh, is an Asian animal from the Fertile Crescent. It's interesting, I find it fascinating that the, the, the hog started in the Fertile Crescent and in South you know, Western Asia, where by and large it is now prohibited to eat um, for religious reasons. Uh, about 8,000 years ago, that's when, when the pig started up. But um, um, <laughs> I, 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 Kathy or someone took a, took a quote out of, of one of my articles to say that I, I, it's very interesting to, to think that um, we <clears throat> domesticated the, the dog from the wolf, but I like to think that the pig domesticated us. And, and why do I think that? Why do I say that? It, it, I just put myself in the pig's place. And uh, think of the villages in Europe or Central, uh, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, Western Asia. And I, I say to myself, well, I'm a pig and I live in this forest. There's all these nuts around there that I can eat. But there are these little villages with all these garbage patches um, or, or uh, tossed out garbage, uh, uh, all sorts of stuff. Uh, and, a, and, a, and if you've ever seen any of the Hannibal Lecter movies, you know that a, a pig is, a, is an omnivore. Will eat almost everything except, I mean, everything except big chunks of metal. Um, they're very opportunistic animals, the boar. And um, I have a feeling that um, they helped us clean up our mess by eating it. So we continue to throw our garbage out the door. They ate it. Um, and they weren't aggressive about anything. They, they had no fangs to... to tussle with us, they, they weren't poisonous, um, they enjoyed our garbage um, and got fat off of it. And every once in a while, I think they just said, okay, do you want one of us? Because you can eat everything on us as well. We're omnivores, just kind of like you, and uh, you can eat everything but our squeak and, um, <clears throat> and, put it, and, and actually salt some of it away for the, for the winter. As a, as a hedge against a, a bad crop. Um, we can be stores for you. Um, so you give us your garbage uh, and, and we'll give you 
uh, a few of us each year. You don't need a lot of us because we're big and, and we're meaty and you can eat so much of us. Um, so let's have it. Let's have this relationship. And I, that's why I say I think in a certain funny way, the pig domesticated us. Um, and it, it is, <clears throat> unless you, you're not allowed to eat it for religious reasons or otherwise, I, um, or don't even you know prefer to eat it, it is one of the most omnivorous foods in the kitchen. I mean, it, it, it goes with everything. Everything goes with it. So many different kinds of pork preparations uh, across the globe, utilizing so many elements in a, in a pantry. Um, and um, and it, it loves salt, uh, a basic element that you could find in, in every cuisine. Um, and without salt, it doesn't taste as good as it can. Um, I find the, the, the hog one of the most wonderful um, foods that, that exists. And, um, and I think we've had a very interesting, good, up until mass factory farming and, and the abuses that we do um, lay on these poor animals, um, we have a good relationship with, with this animal that we call food. Um, the fifth uh, item that I wrote about in the Columbian Exchange that I studied is to me very fascinating as an American, and that's the turkey. Um, it went both from the West via Columbus to the East, but in a very important way for us as Americans, it went from the East to the West um, a couple centuries later. Columbus brought a turkey in uh, after his fourth voyage to our area uh, when he went to the Honduras. And there were two huge flocks of wild turkeys in um, the Western hemisphere, um, in, in, or in, the, in the Honduras area and also in the Southwestern part of the United States. Well, that wasn't the United States, but where, where we are in the United States now. Um, they, looked a lot like and acted a lot like the turkeys that we know today. And um, that's the second part of the story. But Columbus brought one, one of these, some of these to Europe, um, and not sure, sure, you know, a couple of years after his 1492 uh, voyage. And it took off like wildfire in Europe. It immediately supplanted the goose uh, uh, on the Christmas table for the United Kingdom. And all over Europe, uh, people loved the turkey. The, the, um, it, they, they thought maybe that it did come from India because that's where Columbus was supposed to be doing his job. And um, they call it in, in France, they call it the coq d'Inde, the apostrophe I-N-D-E, the, the, the chicken of India. Um, uh, they still call it dand or dandon now. Um, and um, on and on and on. However, the turkey that we know came to our continents, our North American continent, especially from the English who uh, brought it back from Europe after its great popularity there uh, in, 16, uh, in the 1600s. The, there were some wild turkeys in the Northeast and those are the turkeys that you see sometimes portrayed in Thanksgiving day um, uh, pictures or uh, idea, you know, postcards and so forth, whatever. Um, but they, they weren't very tasty. This turkey from the Honduras that went into Europe got very popularized there, it was widespread in Europe, with the big white breasts and so forth and so on, was taken by the English and brought to Jamestown, especially in Virginia, and um, was well received there as well, especially during the famine years that they had there. And that is the turkey that we now uh, have. Um, so as I say, the turkey went from the West, mostly in the southwestern part of our uh, continent in the Caribbean, Honduras, and, and then Central America, excuse me, and then to Europe, and then popularized a couple centuries later, 1600s and so forth, then came over to, to us again, which I find, you know, an interesting story. So that's turkey, number five. Number six is the tomato. And this is where I started my interest in the Colombian exchange. The um, <laughs> I used to teach classes at the University of Chicago. Uh, the first one was the cuisine of India, uh, excuse me, of uh, Italy, the eight-week course. Um, 
we read Ray, Waverly Roots, Food of Italy, some other stuff. It was really a great course. I loved it. I loved teaching it. Students loved reading about it. We cooked some food for ourselves, et cetera. But when I told them that um, the Italians, as Italians, in fact, they weren't Italians at the time, but um, they, they didn't get the tomato until uh, the late 1500s. They, they received it, but they used it as an ornamental plant. It's, its leaves, if you've grown tomatoes, were very aromatic. They had it in the house for that reason sometimes. But uh, to eat it, again, as a member of the nightshade family, it was, it was uh, very, very much feared. So like I, as a, a, before the year 1600, no recipes existed anywhere. 1600, that's only 300 years ago. Um, as, a, as a young country, sometimes we can think about that. We're, we're not that old, but there was no spaghetti with tomato sauce, no insalata caprese, no red gazpacho, no tabule, no um, chicken tikka masala, no fried green tomatoes, no cream of tomato soup, no ketchup, no pico de gallo, no chicken paprikash, or my great sadness, no tomato sandwich. The tomato is not, was not um, taken up by the, by the Italians. Um, it was taken up by the Spanish rulers of Italy, um, but well into um, the late 1500s. Um, when they got used to it, when they got over their fears of it, when they saw that it was eatable, edible, delectable, not poisonous, delicious, man, did they take over? Um, did the tomato take over? Uh, it's, to me, a fascinating vegetable in that regard because I thought that the tomato was in Italy since time anymore. I thought that the Romans ate, ancient Romans ate tomatoes. They did not. It just wasn't there. Cortez brought it over in the early 1500s, and they, as I said, they were afraid of it. It wasn't until the 1600s that the tomato kind of took off. And it and took off indeed. Um, I didn't write about this. It's not on my site. I might write something about it, but I think it's important to talk about one more food stuff that came from the West to the East that we in Colorado particularly like, um, and many people now do, I think, the, the chili or the chile or chilies. As the, the British solved the problem of how to spell chili by using two L's and an I. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Columbus and, and chilies. There are, there are 25 wild forms of chili, uh, only five that are domesticated and grown across the world. From the very, very mild, um, as we call it, the sweet bell pepper, all the way to the extraordinarily hot uh, incendiary um, chiles, uh, like the scotch bonnet and so forth. There are, there are five different kinds. I, they're all in Latin. It's not necessary to go over them. but um, that's it. That's what the world has now. Um, remember that Columbus's number one goal was not to find a route to India. His number one goal really was to find um, an alternative for uh, peeper nigrum, the peppercorn, which was the most highly prized spice of his time and was very, very much in demand um, and it's very costly. It was traded like gold, gold dust. Um, so he went to find India in order to see if he could find another way of getting this uh, this spice. And he, he, you know, he did not find India. That's a that's a, a school child's um, joke. But he did find the chili. And although it's not related to or alike the black peppercorn, the white peppercorn, the green peppercorn. Um, he stumbled on this alternative spice that could be raised in a non-tropical climate, uh, unlike the black peppercorn, unlike the Indian peppercorn. And um, he was very happy with himself. And that's one of the reasons he brought it back in 1493 to the court of Spain to show the, we may not have the black peppercorn here, but we do have this very spicy um, plant fruit that um, can be used to um, enervate, excuse me, to uh, elevate our, 
our, our foods. And um, I think that's a very interesting thing about history that he, um, he stumbled across something that helped him get his job done, even though he didn't get the job done. Um, finally, I I found out today. I did a little bit of research over the last couple of days because I was I read it. I ran across this, but you know the the Scoville unit um, uh, levels of heat in different chilies. It was uh, devised by a, man, a, a pharmacologist called by the name of William Scoville in the eight, late eighteen hundreds. <laughs> he devised a system by which if you took a square centimeter of capsaicin, which is the chemical, the um, amide it is, that makes the heat of chilies um, and uh, diluted it with a certain amount of water to the point where the heat could not be tasted any longer by a panel of five tasters, he assigned that uh, his Scoville unit. So for example, let's say that there's a Scoville unit pepper between 50 and 100,000 Scoville units. That's a pretty hot chili, not a terribly hot chili. They now go into close to 2 million Scoville units, which are chilies that are, um, well, they have contests of it. Can you taste this chili? Um, can you handle this chili? But let's say that the Scoville unit chili is 50 to 100,000. Maybe that's something like a, a jalapeno. Um, that means that a square centimeter of capsaicin isolated from the chili uh, needs to be dissolved in between 50 to 100 liters of water before the, the heat dissipates and no and none of the five tasters can taste it. So the units go up as a as the capsaicin is is more intense because it needs more and more and more and more water. Um, 50 to 100 liters of water um, is a, is 11 to 22 gallons of water, which is a lot of water before you lose. The heat, and that's how the Scoville unit scale is is um, delivered to a particular chili. I thought that was very interesting. Never knew that until I did some some research into it. Well, it's forty minutes after the hour. Um, I've done most of my talking, but I would certainly like to entertain questions from you. Um, Kathy can moderate that. Um, oh, Bill yep. and. I'm we can do questions. Let me pre pre preface this by saying we can do questions on the Colombian Exchange if you like, or on anything else. Uh, if I don't have an answer for a food question or a wine question, I, I'll just say I don't have an answer. But I have done a lot of writing and reading um, over the years. By the way, I've, I've been writing since 1983, which is 40 years, not 50 years. I'm old enough as it is, so I don't need another 10. Um, but I've done I've done I've done a lot and I'd be happy to share my knowledge and, and interest with you. If you have any questions about like of I mean we don't have to do Julia Child questions either. I just assume talk about um, foodstuffs or cooking as I as I have specialized in that over the years. Um, so please thank you very much for your attention, however. I appreciate that. I want you to know that. I have a question for you. Is there a new Colombian exchange going on today? I mean, like I can I can think of one thing, like the kiwi fruit, which took over America. I remember when it first came out years ago, this weird thing that I love now. But are there other, is there a new type of interchange, like it's something as popular as a kiwi fruit? There are probably lots of things, but. Well, yeah, there probably are. I mean, I, um, so I don't know, that that's a loaded question because there's so many foods that can be brought from other places um, when they're at their peak um, and get frequent flyer miles for that. Um, that may or may not be interesting to the place where you know at where they land, but um, and then you know because the, the the retraction from all of that is to buy local, grow local, eat local, um, and therefore you're stuck with what you got at the time in your seed store or whatever um, stuff is there for you now at that time. Or eat eat local kiwi. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I'm sure that there's Californians growing kiwis, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just guess there are. Yeah. So, but there's no Columbus, and that's why there's no Colombian exchange. I mean, okay. there's no. Yeah. There's no, there's no unconquered world that we need to open up and then bring that stuff back to us. I mean, I don't think that that exists. There, there, there will be. We'll be gone. I'll be gone. 
uh, when we colonize you know, other places that have their own um, indigenous foods that we might find interesting and, and bring back. The name of that person that, that, that will give that name to that exchange has yet to be determined. And I'm, I'm waiting to taste my first Martian blueberry. So yeah. that'll be in the future. But anyway, uh, Kathy, I'll turn it over to you and the rest of the crowd to uh, pepper Bill with questions. Uh -huh. okay. No uh, I'm reception. just going to go. Sorry. I'll just go on the questions that we already have sitting in the chat. Um, this is uh, related to the corn portion. Livestock doesn't have to have nixtamalized. Right. Yeah, right. Livestock's a little hardier stomach than we have. It's a question of breaking down the skin and making the nutri nutrients more accessible to the human. Nixtamalization, it's called. It's the application of a, a lye to the white corn, mostly. It's what you get with uh, what we call hominy. And um, it's very popular here in Colorado. In fact, it's being, it's being done by home cooks, just like people grow chickens in their backyard now or raise chickens in their backyard. They, they nixtamalize their own corn and grind it and make their own tortillas and masa from it. Uh, but but uh, as far as I know, ruminants uh, or other animals, chickens and so forth, don't need to, to have it broken down for them to get at the nutrients. I don't know why that is. I'm not an animal um, husband. <laughs> So I, I don't know. <laughs> so why do Mexicans use more U.S. corn? Is their native corn very different? No, it, it, it's just, it is very different. They also don't, they weren't able to grow it to, to, to the same economy of scale that they, they could to buy it from us. I mean, we're a very dominant culture um, in this hemisphere. And um, as you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm sometimes almost ashamed of that, but uh, we grow massive, massive quantities of corn. We're an, a net exporter of corn, even though I think we're the largest producer of corn on the globe. Um, and the Mexicans just, you know, it's a question of price. It isn't the best corn for them to eat. They know that. It's not the best corn we could sell them. We know that. But, um, and that's just slowly changing. I'm very proud of some of the younger Mexicans that I've met over the last few years at these grain conferences who are really trying to get more and more of their own people to grow um, indigenous varieties, color, different colored varieties and use those corns. But, you know, we're talking about a, a massive uh, grain or a massive cereal, right? And uh, just cheaper to buy it. I think maybe that statistic is a couple of years old, so maybe it's lower than 98% now, but nonetheless, it's up there. The Cynthia pointed out, she agreed, the book 1493 is great. She also thought the book 1491, also by Mon, was yeah. interesting. I haven't read that yet. Um, isn't pico de gallo Mexican? Pico de gallo is a Mexican recipe, yeah. But they they don't they didn't make pico de gallo the way we make we know it when when they had the the, the Mexicans didn't get the tomato from the Peruvians uh, the Andeans um, until uh, late in the game either and so they didn't have uh, recipes like gazpacho or pico de gallo or tomato based recipes the way that the the Peruvians did the Peruvians didn't make pico de gallo either they would eat it as a, a vegetable or a fruit. It is a fruit, it's a berry. But uh, the uh, the recipes that I named, uh, not existing before 1600, were did not exist as recipes. They might have been eaten, the, the vegetable, the, excuse me, the fruit might have been eaten, but there was no such thing as pico de gallo. They didn't have the onion, for example. The onion was late to our continent. Um, so they wouldn't be able to use an onion in that recipe. I don't know how they got, I don't know where, uh, how cilantro, where what that path was, but I'm sure it wasn't over here in 1492 or even in 1592. Um, I never think that 300 to 400 years ago, botany wasn't the precise thing. So how did Europe know tomatoes were nightshade family? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a botanist either, but um, there's, you know, leaves, leaves, um, they didn't have genetic testing, of course. Um, 
but they could t- people could tell based on leaf leaf structure um, and um, the way a, a plant flowered, whether it was a member of the Solanum or Solanaceae. I can't pronounce. I don't know the Latin name uh, family, but but it but it was. There were similarities to other things that they knew were nightshade or mandrake or you see so. I mean, I'm just taking them at their word. <laughs> and so I don't, I'm not a scientist or a botanist, so I can't, you know, verify it in language that I would understand either. Next. I, okay, so I'm like 19 miles from the origin of Haas avocados, La Habra Heights, not Whittier. Yeah, that's the origin. I don't know, that's just a... That's the name of the origin, that's the name of the, the origin of the name Haas. I think it has to do with some, some a gentleman named that or a farmer or, or a grower, but the avocado uh, is a is an Aztec. You know, got its name because it has to. It looks like a, a pair of. It looks like a scrotum. It's, that's what the word means in Nahuatl language. And um, interestingly, it, it, it's like Hitler's because it only has one ball. <laughs> <laughs> or Himmler. Sure. There are seed banks, University of California, Davis, for example. What do you think of the value of these preservation efforts, particularly in light of possible changes to food sources due to climate change? I don't understand the question. What do I think about what? The value of these preservation efforts, particularly in light of possible changes to food sources due to climate change. Well, yeah, I mean... Did I mention that in after the drought of 2012, 35 percent of the, the production of uh, genetically modified uh, corn in this country uh, d- dropped by 35 percent because it couldn't handle the drought. So the the more we get to monoculture, or to put it another way, the more the fewer species of plants that we grow to eat or that we grow for our animals to eat, and also the fewer number of species that, of animals that we eat, if we eat them, um, the more we get to monoculture, the, the less diversity there is uh, uh, crop-wide and the greater danger there is to pests, uh, c- climate change, drought, um, wet seasons, El Nino, El, Na, El, El Nina, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea that um, there's the, the idea of preserving seeds, which is I've been reading about actually, and the idea of uh, diversifying crops is um, is a hedge against the damages that I think will be coming because of climate change. Let's just take a simple example. The three, they're, they're called the, the sacred sisters, the three sacred sisters of squash, corn, and beans in the uh, um, indigenous American culture. Why are they sacred and why did they grow them together? They literally grew them together so that the beans would crawl up the, st- the corn stalks and the squash would grow along the ground with its big leaves shielding the ground trapping moisture, keeping pests to the a minimum, et cetera, in this very dry climate that we have here in the Southwest. And they, the, nit- the beans were nitrogen fixers, the corns needed that. The, these three plants grew literally together and then were eaten together and um, were almost a complete um, nutritive profile. There's no more words in the Aztec language for amino acid, however, if you take these three sacred sisters and eat them together, as you can in many different dishes like calabacitas and so forth, um, you're eating a, 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 a almost a complete protein in a vegetarian veg, vegan meal. And but they grew them together. These people farmed thousands and thousands of years ago, uh, diversifying their crops, growing them together, um, and and grew them year after year after year. After. I'm sure that they had issues to deal with too that had to do with climate or pests or seasonal uh, vagaries. <clears throat> but it was a very, very, it still is actually a very you know, wise way to farm and grow food. 
So Cynthia Clampett, uh, first off, pointed out cilantro's from Europe. Okay. I, and, that I thought it, probably, it came from the East because it's so used there, you know. In the, and, and she's actually written a book on pigs. So she said, pigs don't need nixtamalized, sorry, corn, because pigs eat everything. Humans only need nixtamalized corn. Sorry, I know I'm pronouncing that's it That's right, don't no, no worry about it. When they rely heavily on corn because it's not nixtamalized. But you can't, act, but you, oh, okay, so it's not nixtamalized. You can't access the niacin. If you can get niacin from somewhere else, it doesn't matter if the corn is processed. Yeah. Well, a lot of corn is not nixtamalized. Very, very little corn that we eat is nixtamalized. Um, it, the, the, almost all the yellow corns, for example, are not. Um, but anyway. Something lengthy about Benjamin Franklin on his choice of the American turkey as national emblem. Uh -huh. Others object to the bald eagle as looking too much like a dindon or turkey. For my own part, I wish the bald eagle had not been chosen as the representative of our country. He is a bird of bad moral character. He does not get his living honestly. Besides, he is a rank coward. The little king bird is not bigger than a, than a sparrow, attacks him boldly, and drives him out of the district. He is therefore by no means a proper emblem for the brave and honest Cincinnati of America who have driven all of the king birds from our country, though exactly for that order of knights, which the French call Chevalier d'Industry, but I am on this account not displeased that the figure is not known as a bald eagle, but looks more like a turkey. For the truth, the turkey is, in comparison, a much more respectable bird, and without a true, without with all a true original Native America, eagles have been found in all countries, but the turkey was peculiar to ours. The first of the species seen in Europe being brought to France by the Jesuits from Canada. They served up at the wedding table of Charles. <laughs> I know, it just, oh, but it won't finish. He is besides though a little vain and silly, a bird of courage and would not hesitate to attack a grenadier of the British guards who would should presume to invade his farmyard with a red coat on. Phew, sorry, that's long. Uh, anyway, uh, Cynthia wanted to point out that think of ancient Rome. Everyone knew that nightshades were poisonous. So I don't know how that all got to be. Uh, avocados shouldn't exist because giant sloths were the animal that ate avocados. All seed barely and human, uh, and I don't know, something to the way. Oh, and flesh. All seed barely and flesh. Humans are the reason it did disappear. Um, yeah, well, as I said, um, Awahate in the Nahata language. I, I, I got a degree in, the, my, my PhD is in theology from the University of Chicago. So, and I, I was blasphemous enough to say that going there and learning so much theology, I knew more about God than he did. Um, and uh, but there are arguments against the existence of a deity, and the first of them is the avocado. I mean, if if an intelligent uh, deity is going to create a fruit uh, like the avocado, that was a, that's a waste of real estate to put that big of a seed inside of uh, such such delectable fruit. So, um, I my my stance on the avocado is is, is uh, enjoy, it's, it's so wonderful. I have three that I'm having ripen right now in my refrigerator or outside my refrigerator. Um, one is in because it was fully ripe, but I just find it a fascinating, I don't know, it's, it's a tree fruit, um, but uh, no, the seed is way, way too big for what you get. The price of admission. Eating, sure, if you're eating tortillas, look at the package, it will always include Lime as an ingredient, and that means it's been nixtamalized. Thank you, because corn used in pretty much all Mexican applications, other than elotes, will be nixtamalized. Many white corn 
um, preparations to make masa, our minimalized corn. That's correct. But most of the corn that we eat, we eat by eating chicken meat and beef meat, and that is not nixtamalized corn. And a lot of the corn that we eat is off the cob, especially at this time of the year, and um, and out of cans and frozen corn, and that's not nixtamalized either. As I said, humans eat only one fifth of the available corn grown on the globe, uh, and and much of it is not nixtamalized. And the other four fifths of corn is is rarely, if ever, nixtamalized because it doesn't need to be. It's it's fed to animals and made into fuel and uh, syrup and starches and other kinds of things. None of that's nixtamalized. Nixtamalization is a very very small percentage of corn, um, and uh, and that's fine. I mean, it's great. It's a great process. The, in, the Native American, um, now South Americans came up with it. The Mesoamericans came up with it. It, it makes it, it allows human beings to get more nutrients that way and so forth and so on. But let's not fool ourselves. It's, there's nothing special about it. It doesn't make it taste better um, or make it um, more delectable or, or more. It's, it's just a, it's just a thing. And it's a very, very small percentage of the maize that's consumed. Um, yes, sweet potatoes did come from this this part of the, this hemisphere. Um, they came from the Caribbean um, and they were brought by uh, I think it was Cortez actually brought the sweet, no, it was Columbus who brought the sweet potato to, to Europe. Um, Cortez brought the white potato from Peru to uh, Europe. But uh, the sweet potato and, the, and the, the, the potatoes we call potatoes are uh, different families. And um, the reason that they were uh, called sweet potatoes is because they're sweet, but the Spanish confuse them with the potato potato and called it patata. I think it's, if I'm correct. And from the Caribbean word batata for that uh, orange fleshed or yellow fleshed um, tuber. And um, so that's why they're called sweet potatoes. And don't get me going started. I can't remember my screed on the difference between sweet potatoes and yams that I wrote once about at Thanksgiving, but so. But they did come from us to them. Okay. Uh, any other questions, people? I'm sorry to ask you the loaded lobster question. No, yeah, that's I it's just, just don't on top of my mind at the moment. I just don't have an answer because I don't know anything. Have I met anybody when I was living in Chicago that's online that's on right now? Okay, just curious. Well, I know you came to that class we did with Andy Smith on food writing, but that was not the same. No, I don't remember that. I'm sorry. I don't, oh, that's okay. I remember you. Me. That's enough, right? A lot of, a lot of things I don't remember as well. So. Hey, Scott, you want to sign us off? Well, I want to thank you for your, your bounty, your cornucopia of information. And I learned something very new tonight, uh, a new word ever since I saw the movie. Mary Poppins and learned supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Now I've learned a new one tonight, nixtamalized. Nixtamalized. So I will be forever grateful. And, and thank you so much for your, for your bounty of, of knowledge here. And, uh, and uh, anyway, you know where Chicago is, so you're always welcome back. So you take care, Bill. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much. And again, I, I can plug for myself. I, uh, yes. Go to BillStJohn.com, B-I-L-L-S-T-J-O-H-N. The, um, the website is Get Cooking with Bill St. John, and um, I'd love to have you sign up. I, I send out a weekly newsletter, and I keep building my content. Over the last 40 years, I've written close to 5,000 articles. I'm trying to get most of them. I, don't, I can't put all of them on there. There's no point in doing it either, but I'm trying to get many of them on there um, so that there'll be a resource for people. They don't have to go to the chicagotribune.com or the denverpost.com to find my stuff because um, there's paywalls now and so forth. But, I've got it all. I own it. And I'd like to get you to be able to read it if you like, or search for recipes or search for cooking ideas, or indeed to send me some of your own, because I think I could use some of that and send that to other people as well. So if you have ideas, cooking ideas or cooking suggestions, please, uh, please send them along. 
Thanks one, very much for your time. One last thing. Uh, I, I have looked at your website. It's outstanding. It is chock full of information and fascinating stuff, beautifully written. And so I would recommend, uh, again, can you say slowly spell out what your simple website is again? The yeah, the, the, the URL is B-I-L-L-S-T-J-O-H-N.com, BillStJohn.com. Yeah. Um, and the, 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 the name of the website is Get Cooking with Bill St. John. It, it comes from my, it's a play on words. I want people to get or understand or be educated in or learn more about cooking, get it. But I also want people to get cooking. It's exhortative. I want people to get cooking. I want people to cook food for themselves and their families and their friends because it's a very, very wonderful thing for, for us to do. Um, as a mindful practice and as something that put, puts us in touch with beauty and, and, uh, and the beauty of the world, beauty of things. And yeah. um, so. And, 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 and again, uh, I'm sure your newsletter is wonderful. So let's all, I'm, as soon as I finish this, I'm signing up for your newsletter myself. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for your attention. And, and uh, I'd be glad to see you online. Great. A better Thanks. writer than I am a Zoomer. <laughs> it just takes practice yeah <laughs> thanks again bye guys thank you very much appreciate good night. it good night meeting you this way bye bye